you're listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. And today I've got a real treat. We're venturing out of the realms of guitar teaching and exploring a special interview with the big boss man himself, Tim Topham. Tim, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been called that before. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Good to be here. Great to uh, chat with you. It's great to have you. And for all our listeners, uh, you may know me just from the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast, but Tim uh, is the man behind Top Music and the head of the wonderful team and support network that we have uh, behind the podcast as well. So he's the whole reason we've got Top Music Guitar and the podcast is happening in the first place. And I don't know how it's taken us, you know, close to 100 episodes to finally get you on the show, but we've got you here and it's uh, going to be a good one. I know our listeners are going to appreciate it. I'm impressed. Uh, congratulations on the 100 podcasts or close to. I, I know how hard that work is to get there. So congratulations and, and well done. And thank you for being the leader of our whole guitar network and content and our membership. It's great to have you with us. No, it's been totally awesome and a privilege to work with you and obviously to uh, extend the Top Music uh, teaching membership to guitar teachers specifically. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit later. But Tim, for those of uh, our listeners who aren't necessarily Top Music members uh, and may not have heard of you before, can you give them a brief overview of your teaching journey so far and how you've transitioned from a piano teacher into the entrepreneurial journey and created one of the biggest music teaching membership programs that are around? Yeah, sure. It, well, it wasn't all that well planned, I have to say, Michael. As per many people who go into business, it kind of emerges out of a need that you see that kind of develops over time. So, I uh, I was late to piano teaching. I, I learned piano when I was a kid from about age 8 to 14 or thereabouts. I did sort of classical music. I did my exam grades and then I did some jazz piano and then I really – and I, I did study it in year 11 at school as well uh, when I was about – so that's about 17 over here. And then I really didn't play or teach piano for some time after that. I kept my my sort of hand in in regard to accompanying and I played for, for musical theatre and I conducted musicals and – I might accompany the odd singer or friend of mine and, and things like that. So I was always playing and involved in music, but I went off on a massive tangent. I went right into outdoor education and PE teaching. I toured in England and then Perth and I was head of a campus for a while and I did all sorts of other things while just doing the music on the side. And then I came back full circle um, early, or oh, what would this be, mid-2000s, I think it would have been when I came back to Melbourne after a lot of travel and teaching in other areas and I thought, uh, well, this would be great to make a bit of money. I was sort of relief teaching on the side. There wasn't all that much income coming in. I thought, why don't I try some piano teaching? So I thought, yes, I've, I've played piano so I can teach it, right? Isn't that what everyone, <laughs> everyone thinks? Uh, and so I found some students and then realized I was way over my head and I needed help. And I reconnected with my childhood piano teacher, which was an amazing experience. She'd long retired, but was only too eager to help me. And so she sort of took me under her wing, taught me everything she know, knew, gave me all her resources, and I was able to start feeling confident with this piano teaching gig. And then from there, uh, I started, this is about 2010, I guess, I started recording videos about some of the things I was doing in lessons. And I think the experience that I'd had in not following a very traditional path to becoming a music teacher all of, teaching all these other subjects, teaching classrooms, teaching whole campsites full of people, and that allowed me to bring new perspectives into what I was doing. And I had other teachers at the school I was at at the time sort of going, hey, what the, that sounds really cool and your, your students are all having fun and how are you getting more students because we're struggling over here. And so I started recording videos about what I was doing in the lessons that was a little bit unusual 
And that really is how I merged across into teaching other teachers. People found me online, thought it was kind of cool what I was doing, so I created a course about it. That was uh, the first course in regard to teaching pop music at the time. And then uh, the membership came from that, and it's just built uh, organically over time from there. That's amazing and really interesting to hear you started sort of documenting the process and uh, showing other people or whether it was intended for other people or not, you were putting it out there for the world to see and obviously attracted a certain number of people. Yeah, it, 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 there wasn't really a goal, oh, I really want 100 subscribers on on anything. I, I just started recording videos and interviewing people and writing blogs. I, I started writing blogs in 2010 and collecting email addresses from people that wanted to download things and that it just literally just grew from there. I'd, I'd, I'd hit the right spot in regard to some of the challenges around piano teaching, which which doesn't affect guitar teachers in the same way and we might come to this as well later because the piano teaching world is very steeped in tradition and classical education and reading and all of those kinds of things. When teachers started realising that a lot of their kids weren't into that so much as they might have been 20 years prior, they needed help. And they were getting kids learning stuff on YouTube for the first time and wanting to play video game music. And all of these things were new and they needed help. And I was only too happy to provide that help because I want to see more students stay with piano and music more generally and and have success. So I was only too happy to help the teachers. Yeah, that's definitely it. And I think uh, the world is always changing and uh, a lot of people are finding the old ways of doing things are somewhat disconnected. Um, and happy to talk more about that. But what were some of the uh, the problems that these teachers were having that you were able to identify? Because I'm sure there would still be some over, overlap and parallel with our guitar teachers. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, one of the big differences between guitar and piano is that in my experience, guitar, you will generally, it would be normal to pick up a guitar and teach kids some chords and some riffs and some cool songs and things that they want to do. And that's kind of normal, I think. You don't open a method book on that first lesson and start teaching them notation. You probably don't even introduce tab, uh, right, for quite some time. Uh, I think I'm right in saying this. So the difference with piano, of course, is that that, that is the reverse. The standard is that, that teachers are used to delivering. The challenge is that students, and to answer your question, students were quitting lessons because there were there was this disconnect between what students were wanting from music education and what teachers were delivering in the lessons. And so I was really trying to help teachers avoid having their students quit through just a misunderstanding and a misalignment of what they should be doing. And that's why one of our top music pillars is student first approach. The giving of autonomy to students, particularly particularly teenage students and adult students, is so, so important to their self-motivation uh, and having that balance, walking that balance between what they want to learn and what we know they should learn, an ongoing challenge for any teacher, but one that I think teachers 20 years ago didn't really have, they didn't have to walk that line. They just taught what they've taught before and the students would learn <laughs> but students today are just different technology has impacted everything they can get everything every answer they need on their phone they can learn anything they want to play by watching a tutorial they don't need us for that so we're then sort of left with okay well, what is our role and you know there's lots of change going on right now yeah i think that's uh the, the word misalignment really jumps out because I noticed that in guitar as well. There's this huge misalignment with uh, what the academic approach has been traditionally and then, of course, what students want to learn. And as you've also said, the students don't necessarily need us anymore. They can get their tutorials anytime they want. Anything you can think of, there's a free YouTube video of it from there. But obviously, in different regards for technique and to show them the path, you know, we're, we're now more necessary than ever because there's just that much out there. But I think... Uh, yeah, well, they don't think they need us, of course, but we have to show them <laughs> that they actually do need us. Exactly. And any teacher that's had a student come and play something that they've learned from a YouTube tutorial will look at the choices of fingers that they use and how they move around their instrument and it's a diabolical generally. So there is a need for us. We are not superfluous. We are required. Uh, we just have to find how that modern tech paradigm fits in with somewhat traditional approaches that we might be used to. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. And um, uh, <laughs> I could go on for ages about students who think they know everything and you're like, well, how come you're coming to lessons then? Because you obviously don't. 
But uh, <laughs> it was interesting to uh, hear you sort of talk about the fact that um, students don't want to read for piano or, or guitar. You go straight to chords. Well, it's actually interesting because if you buy, I would say, 9 out of 10 or, you know, closer to 96, 97 out of 100 guitar method books, or at least the ones from the big publishers, and they're all straight back to here's the first string, let's learn how to read these notes and let's play these exercises. Here's the second string, here's your next three notes, and then it's straight into, you know, nursery oh, rhymes and things. I didn't realise. Yeah, so, so the method books in guitar do the same thing as piano. Correct. They have this big Definitely. focus on reading and some of them have, you know, cottoned on to the fact that, uh, okay, maybe these nursery rhymes are a bit out of touch, so they'll give you guitar tabs. Sorry, I mucked that up, but the, the, you know, this reading's a bit out of touch. Here's the guitar tab versions. They give you the guitar tab version of the same book. So it solves one problem in, okay, now we can play it a little bit easier, but it doesn't solve uh, the problem of the fact that we're still learning nursery rhymes or 200-year-old folk songs, which there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're an adult and, you, you know, you're learning Mary Had a Little Lamb <laughs> as your first song, in it's lesson somewhat, <laughs> yeah, lesson one, you're somewhat, you know, demotivated from the very beginning. And um, that's where, you know, my guitar ninjas has gone, okay, how do we do some contemporary examples and this, this and that. And, uh, yeah, there's also... I think uh, Hal Leonard's got a, a new guitar riffs book, which is literally just like uh, beginner guitar riffs. And there's a whole collection of, you know, two bar, three bar guitar riffs, which I, th- I think is really, really good. But at the same time, it's uh, some of them are overly complicated and other ones are, you know, ridiculously easy. There's no sort of progression through it. It's just a, a collection of, uh, this is me being cynical, but a, a collection of, <laughs> the riffs that they had the license for or the, you know, the publishing rights to oh, yeah. and have just gone, yep, these are the ones we can get away with putting down here. So we're going to expose you to this limited uh, amount of, of things here. So, yeah, I understand the publishers. Um, oh, sorry, one final point. I understand the publishers have got something to work with and, and that's what gets put out. But you can't really condense 20 to 30 years of jazz history into a or even 100 years of music into a – a term or a semester for study in academia. And that's what's sort of happening is you've got these academic approaches trickling down into method books for the common person when, you know, to be a hobby player and a professional player are really different. But sorry, Tim, back to your point. Well, I was just going to, uh, I can't actually, I've lost my train of thought. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, dang, I bet you it was a good one. <laughs> and that's where um, obviously getting into guitar ninjas with the, the tabs and everything is just say, hey, tab is the biggest, uh, music educational hack that's ever existed. And mind you, guitar tablature in the form of lute tablature actually predates uh, the musical, the grand staff in musical notation. If you actually go back far enough, uh, they've actually found lute tablature where there's this four string tab and, and numbers and things on it to help people learn that way. So I thought that was an interesting thing to, to point out there. But uh, yeah, this standard notation is hands down the easiest way to get people to quit music prematurely. And um, it doesn't have to be done that way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And look, I, I think we're both in the camp that says there's nothing wrong with teaching reading. In fact, it's a really good skill to have. My argument is that it just shouldn't be the first thing that students are taught. And that's the whole point behind the book that I've written called No Book Beginners, which is all about just let's just delay the reading as I think many guitar teachers probably would, and I think this is where we are different. While the guitar methods may also start with reading, most guitar teachers probably don't open that up in the first lesson. Maybe they do, I'm not sure. But I would say 98% of music teachers, piano teachers, do open the method book in the first lesson. And I'm saying, hold on, hold on. There are much more important things, fun things, engaging things, deeply musical things we can be doing in those first few lessons that will engage students, build their curiosity, build their engagement, make them imaginative, you know, build on their imagination, make them more creative before we get to the reading. So let's do the reading. Let's just leave it for a few weeks. There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's an amazing point of view and it's so different to what most people sort of uh, envision when it comes to lessons. It goes straight back to uh, if I put myself in my own shoes, is a, a, my younger cousin's like, oh, can – I want to learn guitar. Can you teach me something? Or can I take lessons? The first thing is like, oh, what did I get taught? Well, I got taught out of this method book or, oh, okay, well, we'll get you a book and we'll work our way through that. There's never any of that thought that you've just given about nurturing creativity, about making it fun, about having that, how, how do you stretch out that childlike 
uh, curiosity so that we're not just, um, you know, making a chore out of lessons or making a routine out of learning an instrument. And I think that's something that's definitely missing from most modern musical education. But there's also all the music musicality skills that tend to be forgotten as well or just ignored until later on. Things like mu- uh, singing. I'm very passionate about getting kids, particularly piano students and guitar for that matter, singing. In, and the earlier you do it and the more you normalise it, the more it doesn't become awkward when they're sort of 10 to 12 and you suddenly ask them, oh, let's do some singing. Of course they're going to freak out if they've never done it before. But if you've started that from age six or seven, then it just becomes a normal part of the lesson. And we know there are many, many benefits for instrumental students for being able to sing. Uh, other skills that we can introduce in those lessons before reading, uh, the ability to pitch match, to play what they hear, to uh, play by ear, to understand basic harmony, to understand and be able to hum and feel a home key and maybe a dominant key or key centres, tonal movement, to be able to clap in rhythm, to be able to play in time, feel a pulse. These are all things that are critical and super useful for music teachers but so often ignored if we just go, okay, here's middle C, let's play middle C, here's a G on the guitar, bling, hold it for two counts. Let's just get away from that and let's do some music fun musical engagement skills yeah and that's something i think is really missing from a lot of guitar education is uh me particularly being a rock player is you know there was no such thing as dynamics until i got into university and all of a sudden we had to, <laughs> <laughs> to to worry about that it was all just like you know one volume distortion or not and that's just how does it can be exactly does it go to 11 that's just you know the nature of the electric guitar <laughs> is just crank it up and make some noise and, and have some fun but uh, just teaching kids, and this is something that I've done with my students, is, all right, guys, hit it as hard as you can. All right, now hit it harder. You know, you really rev them up. And then, all right, now that, come on, hit it like you mean it. You make them play as loud as they can. They have a blast. You go, okay, now play it as soft as you can. No, no, play as soft as you can. Softer. And you just get them that dynamic range of how hard or soft they hit can really influence, particularly on an, an acoustic guitar. And you can make a really fun, you know, five to ten minute block of a lesson out of just that. And uh, meanwhile, us guitar teachers, and I'm sure many piano teachers and many of the listeners will be listening to this, is having to carry five or six different books to every single like uh, shift of teaching back when I worked at a music shop. I needed this book for this person, this book for that person, and this book for chords, and this book for sight reading. And it was just all over the place. There was no consolidated method or no strict pathway. It was just, okay, I've got to get a big hodgepodge of things to to help the needs of my individual students. So the idea of just rocking up without a book and teaching people is completely foreign. So how about you tell us a little bit more about the the concept of no book beginners and then about your book in general? Yeah, well, and, and that is the, the big challenge for teachers. It's like, okay, Tim and Michael, I, I hear what you're saying. That makes sense, i.e. let's do some other things before the reading. But holy moly, what do I do? I help. help. Uh, I, I don't know what to do if I don't have a method book in front of me and I can turn to the next page to introduce the next skill. So that's why I put together No Book Beginners. So No Book Beginners is uh, a book and it's also a course, an online course with lesson plans that covers the first up to 10 weeks of No Book Teaching for a piano teacher. So this is specifically piano teaching, but we can talk about the crossovers and there are many with guitar and maybe you can even help me make some of those connections. But pretty much what the book does is it, and the book's just coming out now, is actually talks about the history, how we've actually got to this point where music reading is the thing to do because it wasn't back in 1700, everyone was an improviser. That's how you made money. You created music. That's why there's fireworks music and water music and Packabell's Cannon and all those things. If uh, if we were all performers back then, we wouldn't have any of that amazing music. So we talk about what's happened over the course of history, why it's changed, what we've lost by going to reading in those first few, few lessons and how we can do it differently. And so the second part of the book is lesson plans for, and we give full lesson plans for five weeks worth of no book teaching, literally stepping teachers through, here's what to say, here's what to do. And, you know, in that in that very first lesson, once you've welcomed the student and had a, like, oh, it's so great to see you and, oh, what did you do on the weekend and all that, all that kind of fun stuff, the first thing we do is just ask them, what do you want to play? Hey, 
Hey there, guys. It's Michael here with a quick message from Top Music. Are you a passionate guitar teacher looking for tips to make lessons more fun and engaging for your students? Maybe you're struggling to grow your business and need help getting more students to take lessons with you. Maybe you're a guitar player who wants to get out of a day job and make music your full-time gig with some teaching on the side. If you found yourself saying yes, then look no further than a membership with us at Top Music Guitar. Top Music is a place music teachers can come together from all over the world to share ideas, develop both their teaching skills and their business knowledge, and receive advice from industry experts. You'll get access to over 20 courses for guitar teachers and a host of general music teaching resources that will help you have a bigger impact on your students, teach better lessons, and of course, make you more money. For less than the price of what you charge for a private lesson, $49 per month, you'll get access to everything you need to bring your studio to life and become the best teacher you can be. Join now at www.topmusicguitar.com. Now, back to the podcast. Play me something. Let's 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 play some music. Uh, and I've never had a student not be able to play something with a little bit of encouragement. Could be Mary had a little lamb. It could be for release that you hate. It could be a video game music you've never heard. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. It could be chopsticks. Da, 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 whatever. Play along with them. Encourage them. Set up a, a beat on a on a on an app or change the sound to a string thing if you're on a digital instrument, whatever it is, just spend five minutes engaging with that student on the thing that they can play. Uh, have a little bit of fun with it. And then the next thing, we uh, we just get basic technique sorted out. We don't go into any depth really for piano. It's just about the sitting position, getting the seated height right. And there's some fun engagement there with they, they teach you how to sit properly and you sit badly as a teacher and then they do the same thing and they do that to their parents when they get home. Uh, and then we do some creative improvising. So black key improvising for piano. Um, I'm not sure if there's equivalent on guitar. Open string, I guess, maybe. Um, so that they can't really make a wrong note. You encourage lots of pedal. There's backing tracks to play along with. Um, and then we do also an animal improv where we try and tell a story of animals. We sort of talk about what animal might be thumping down low on the piano and what animal makes twinkly sounds up high. And then could we tell a story using that? So that's kind of, you know, that's the structure of the lessons and it's just stepped through step by step. This is what you do. This is how it works. And we've got a companion website with all the videos of me demonstrating this at the instrument as well. Sounds absolutely amazing. And the first thing I noticed that jumps out is just the focus on getting to know the instrument, having fun and even creativity and improvisation. I think that's the biggest thing that's often missing from contemporary education is that ability to play and create, which is often thought of something that you come back to in five or six years. Once you can play the instrument, now you can start getting creative with it. So what are your thoughts on that sort of process of delaying the creativity? Well, the problem is that if you delay it too long, the student's going to quit and never <laughs> never get to the point where they'll be able to do it. The problem is with engagement of students at instruments these days, that student first thing that I was talking about earlier and that balance between what they want to do and what we know that they should do, we have to walk that line all the time. Otherwise, so if a student does come in and we only teach them their exam pieces or just the traditional whatever it is and take no regard for that, what they want to learn, a 12-year-old, 13-year-old is going to quit, probably. They're not going to see out the next few years if there's, they've got no autonomy in what they do. And unfortunately, that means they're going to quit and they're probably not going to come back. Whereas if we're flexible with our approach, even if we don't necessarily like it so much or a little, maybe we're a little bit out of our comfort zone, a bit uncomfortable, if we can help them, particularly over that 12 to 14 age period, which is the hardest, the, the most dropouts occur then, if we can get them through that period by teaching them some cool hooks to show off to their friends and teach them some things that they want to learn, then they'll maybe start getting over that hump and stick with music for, for the long term. That's really what, what I'm trying to get at is that flexibility of approach is just critical and it's become more critical in the last five years, even than five years before that. Yeah, and I think ultimately like people are – Fragile isn't necessarily the right word, but that instant gratification, everyone's chasing instant gratification. A lot of people are doing things for that, you know, admiration factor. Look at me, I can do this. And people just don't have the discipline or the attention span to put in the hard work that they used to. So that traditional approach 
you know, where maybe 30 out of 100 would have stuck with it for a certain period of time, or at least their parents would have locked them in to say, hey, I've paid good money for this. We're <laughs> not going to pull you out now. Obviously, if the kids are throwing the temper tantrums and not enjoying it and not sticking with it, no one's going to get to that point, as you said before, where uh, they stick it out for six months to get to month number seven when it starts clicking into place and feeling easy or no one's getting to month number three, sorry, year number three, where they've got control over almost any basic repertoire and can start having fun. So I can definitely see how that's important to get them playing along straight away. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, and, and again, I shouldn't, I should, just as I, I was saying before, reading isn't bad and I'm not saying don't teach reading. I also don't advocate for a pure diet of trying to help students with YouTube tutorials and nothing else because that's not good teaching either. It's about a balance and it's a challenge sometimes. Some students will refuse to learn to read or will only want to play one type of repertoire. And I've, I've interviewed people on podcasts before, one of them, was telling me that this mid teenager would only want to play the Beatles and and nothing else. And this teacher stuck with that for a year <laughs> before the student was like, you know what? I'm having this is this is good, but I want to let's do some other stuff. Let's I really like to learn some different repertoire. Now that's an extreme and most teachers wouldn't hang around be able to do that for that long. But that's the kind of student first approach we're talking about. Just giving them those the chance to play what they want to play. And yes, you know, yes, it is a bit about showing off, but part of a child and particularly a tween becoming identifying themselves as a musician is getting admiration from other people. And if that means that they can play stairway to heaven backwards or upside down or whatever it is at their, their a school assembly, then help them do it. Because then they're going to get the the praise and the kudos from everybody around them saying, oh, that Michael is the coolest guitarist. And Michael goes, I think I'm a guitarist. And guess what Michael's going to do? He's going to play more guitar. That's what we want. <laughs> and don't underestimate the uh, uh, the guitar teachers listening, teaching them the, the tricks and the movement and the stage moves, like all that kind of stuff, which is showy oh, off yeah. is definitely something you can milk. And the, the fact that uh, well, one thing my teacher Dave did really well is – we had a band workshop program at high school, but at some point during one of those things, he goes, okay, guys, we've got to actually learn how to look cool on stage. <laughs> and uh, he's like, here's the power pose. It was almost like that school of rock, like a year before school of rock came out or something like that. So he's like, you've got to actually look the part, do this, this and that. And he, and he goes, and this will help you in your exam later on where you don't just stand there petrified trying to not to play a bad note. If you play with conviction, that confidence will, will, will translate. And again, how often have you had a guitar lesson where you stand the student up and say, hey, we're playing standing up today and let's just play rocking back and forth or let's uh, try this cool move or, hey, let's try playing Sweet Child of Mine behind our head because, you know, then you can go off and show all your other students. And by the way, if you record... <laughs> your students doing that and put it on Instagram, all your friends will think you're a really cool teacher as well because you're teaching all these rock stars. So I'm giving away some of my social media secrets here, but things like uh, getting your students to play the like finger tapping eruption isn't actually that hard. And when you play finger tapping, finger tapping, Tim is um, really fast arpeggios done on a single string. So on a piano, it's super basic, but on a guitar because of the length of the the individual strings, the intervals are quite far apart. And uh, so it's a visually cool looking thing to do, which uh, it sounds... the right hand? Yeah, so your left hand does two notes. Your fretting hand would do two notes and your right hand would typically tap the third note higher up the arpeggio. All right, okay, cool. I'll demonstrate it off air because I don't have any plugged in guitars (laughs) in the room right now, but uh, all our listeners will know what we're talking about. But uh, a lot of it is, um, that, that is like, I don't know what... (laughs) <laughs> be careful with my analogies here, but that's the coolest thing you can teach, you know, someone who's 14 to 17 and into rock music. And once they can do it, they just want to show it off to everyone. And it sounds, it's one of the coolest sounding things you can do on it, you know, a plugged in electric guitar crank to 11. And yeah, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And your ability but, but to but that capture that lightning. The whole diet of the lessons. Exactly. Just, that's just one little element. And guitar plays, again, the flip side of that is you get people in their forties coming to me saying, oh man, I can play anything, but I can't tell you what I'm playing and uh, I can't create something of my own. So uh, if you have the imbalanced diet, you know, it, it creates 
problems short term and long term. So again, we've got to try and get that that right balance. And what you're saying is, you know, give your students what they want, but sometimes you've got to give them what they need. And I really like disguising what they they need in what they want. So if a kid likes the Beatles, well, here's all the things I need to teach you. I'm just going to look for the relevant Beatles songs that has each of these techniques or theory concepts or things like that. But ultimately, I think teachers need to understand that their role isn't to get them to pass an exam or it isn't to get their students to necessarily become great players. It's to get your students to fall in love with the instrument, to have that appreciation for it and nurture that passion so it increases the likelihood that it will become a long-term thing. And once it becomes a long-term thing, then your student's going to buy in and they're eventually going to get to that journey. You know, if I work, walk from my house to your house, like if, if I drive there, it's probably going to be 20 minutes. If I ride my bike there, it's probably going to be an hour. If I walk there, it's probably going to be, you know, a whole day. We've got to help our students take one step at a time. Now, if we can get them in a car, It'll be quick if you get them in a helicopter or a plane. It'll be a very, very fast journey. But as long as they don't stop taking one step a day, they'll eventually get to their destination. So we've just got to keep our students learning for as long as possible. Well said. Yeah, I like that. We need to give them you know, something about what they want and what they need and disguising what they need. It's like, you know, as a, as a parent putting vegetables in the bolognese, right? <laughs> Giving them what they need through the thing that they enjoy. Uh, I like it. That's a great analogy. Yeah, and something else I... I Maybe I'll bounce this idea off you because I haven't explored it all that much. But something I'm coming, I'm noticing is there's two types of students, and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate this as well, is there's the people from day one who are like, I want to be a guitar player, I want to be a piano player, what do I need to do? And they've already made that decision. Then there's the other people who, they're just everyday people who are trying out guitar or seeing if they like it. And at some point in time, a switch may flip and they go, oh, I'm a guitarist. And the behavior involves, you know, practicing daily, checking out YouTube videos of gear, hanging out guitar shops, fighting with other guitar players online about who the best guitar player is. Like there's certain behaviors that guitar players have. And when they adopt that identity, that's when their progress shoots through the roof. And you can see some kids who they take five years of lessons and they don't click with it, then they they see the Beatles, or they see Van Halen or a video of Jimi Hendrix and go, I want to do that. And then all of a sudden they practice three hours a day. And it, it took them five years to get to that point. And then there was an overnight change in identity and they, they shot forward. So maybe a, a new point of uh, reflection for you, but what are your thoughts on adapting piano playing or guitar playing as part of your identity and then shaping it from there? I resonate with that. I think it's. I think you are right. There are those two groups of people, and I think it's probably ninety five percent the second group. <laughs> Unfortunately for us, trying it out. Yeah, that's right. Just trying it out. Let's and the biggest source of our frustration out. is that as teachers, we're often in the five percent, uh, and we're trying to get the ninety five percent to do what we did growing up, and and that's a big source of frustration. Yeah, and, and we of course we want the investment. We want the people who are coming to lessons like they're going to school. I mean, no parent signs their child up for a month of school and then we'll change school and we'll try a different school or whatever. And of course, you, you, you sign them up for seven years. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a great analogy. Want, but unfortunately, <laughs> fortunately, we don't get that. We, as you say, 95% are trying trying it out that they, they feel like they want to try it or they've been playing around and they give it a shot. Our challenge as you've said is to get them to that point where they suddenly switch and I know you had that point when you were 15 or something I remember interviewing you for my podcast and you you mentioned that point where you suddenly went bang I'm going to practice 10 hours a day and all that kind of stuff Mike Grande who's been on the sh- on my show he said that he had the same thing his sons had the same thing some there's this point there's this inflection point at which if we do the right things kids will flick over and they will continue lessons past uh sorry they will continue playing music well into the future i I was actually as as you were talking reflecting on my own journey which is unusual because i kind of i wasn't a very good student to be honest i did my sort of grade one and then i did grade six and then i really wanted nothing more to do with classical music i thought it was lame and boring so i went to do some jazz and i stuck with that for a little bit but that really didn't capture me either so i and that was about age 14, I remember, 14, 15. And then I did music at school, age 17. I was pretty at risk, I would have thought, of 
quitting. So I was trying to think then what actually, because I didn't have a massive inflection. Well, maybe I did. <laughs> maybe it wasn't, it just wasn't clear for me. But the thing I was thinking about that kept me playing was my ability to sight read and a company and all of that is wrapped up in my the exploring that I did when I was younger on keyboards and th- since creating my own music and understanding chords and harmony. And that's why I've been so passionate my entire career helping teachers get students understanding chords and harmony and creating music and pop song composition and those kinds of things because that's the thing really for me that kept me playing all through was my ability to just sit down and play something, to play by ear, to play a pop song, to accompany a singer, those those, those skills. So I was a little bit different too. You've, you've made me actually think about my own journey there. Well, I, I think something that's worth pointing out is also the fact that you might take for granted how much playing you actually did. And for many people, their experience learning an instrument is we're going to do 11 months of lessons, then an exam, or six months of lessons, then an exam. And the only performances they get are the exams with the occasional, you know, if you had like a, a music class at school, you might get up at assembly every now and then if your teacher, you know, selected you. Uh, but for me, oh, just imagine if you went to football training for 11 months and you played one game at the end of the year and then you trained for another 11 months <laughs> and played one game. It would seem ridiculous. You're like, why am I doing all this practicing and training and only having one day for payoff? But that's what it's like for so many people learning an instrument. So a big thing that I advocate for is a once a month jam session. So all my students at my academy can come and jam with other people at least once a month. And every two or three months, we have some form of concert uh, because we want a deadline to work towards because having these artificial deadlines obviously invokes Parkinson's law and gets people to get their act together. But playing with other people, that's 30% of, you know, all the fun you're going to have on guitar and performing. Most people go, you know, 60% of the enjoyment of the instrument they never experience once in their lifetime of, of, of learning, whether they take six months of lessons or six years of lessons. I think that's, you know, really bad and uh, something a lot of teachers can do to better facilitate for their students the actual experience of playing. The problem is often we need to get to a certain level before we can go out and play and perform and experience that properly. But Again, coming back to the level up system that I've got is we can get students playing within a month. It's, it's not so much their physical ability, it's their confidence and, and belief that they can do it or not. But uh, many people are in this constant state of not feeling good enough. And this is speaking to, you know, the professional into musicians or the intermediates of oh, I'm not good enough to perform yet when often, you know, they're, they're well and truly in that area of being able to play. Yeah, that 30%, I think you said about social playing and jamming. See, that's critically missing in a lot of piano education. And when I ask teachers and when I think back myself, what are the key moments in my musical history and upbringing do I remember the most? The ones that I remember are when I was playing for a school musical or accompanying a singer or jamming in a garage band or playing with other people. This social element is so important. And I think guitar, you guys get this much more than piano teachers because piano is a much more solitary instrument than guitar. So to the piano teachers, I, you know, I really encourage that social music making. If it's not playing with another person or accompanying somebody or playing a duet, then playing with the teacher or at least a backing track or something, some other thing because that provides so much, so many memories, number one, but also, again, it's, it provides that, that buzz that you get from just playing with other people. It's why group classes for piano are becoming more and more popular right now because we're seeing and we're understanding the benefits of the social interaction. Yeah, very, very well said. And I think the fact you've just reflected upon this now, teachers could do really well to look back and say, hey, what are all the highlights of my learning experience? And what were they based on? And most of them are going to be on, you know, oh, there was this party that I played guitar at and I got to be the cool kid for the first time because everyone sung along. Or, hey, we used to spend every Saturday afternoon jamming uh, as a band and we might have been terrible for a couple of months and then all of a sudden we weren't terrible and people were coming to our shows and or this really cool milestone performance that I did. And these are the kind of things, okay, well, we lived and breathed for those moments. Why is our teaching so stale in comparison or why is our teaching not leading towards these outcomes and uh, Philip Johnson, who did a, a presentation at your event um, a couple of years back, he did an amazing presentation called the million dollar studio or something like that. What would I do if I had a million dollars? 
And it, I thought it was going to be a business talk, but it was just about imagining all the cool things you could do and then going, well, you don't actually need this. You could make it happen with, you know, peanuts worth of technology. If you've got a MacBook and a, this, you can do that. Or So, you know, mm. imagining all the cool things you could do with your students and then going, well, I don't actually, well, what is stopping me from doing that now? It just might be, you know, six weeks of practicing a certain thing or, hey, I've just got to actually ask 20 of my students do you guys want to perform in three weeks or probably not ask them, just tell them, Hey, we've got a concert coming up in three months and uh, let's do it. So more often than not, we can actually just by making that decision, having an idea and creating an action plan is we can get the, the ball moving forward in, in many valuable things. Yeah. And the only caveat I would give to that is that I myself never enjoyed performing as a child, particularly. And so I, but I was playing lots at home and I had these, synthesizers which were pretty basic back then but i would compose all the time and create things and play them for my family at home and i would love doing that so i think one thing i would say too particularly for piano is the the end goals and i agree with you we do need these milestone events something Mm. to celebrate music by But just keep in mind that not every child will necessarily want to perform at a recital and put on a nice outfit and and play on on a stage. There may be other ways that you can engage and get the output and the confidence and that buzz that the student resonates with more. So, yeah, I'll just kind of throw that out there. Yeah, I think that's an extremely valid point. And I definitely, being quite extroverted, uh, I'm all about, yeah, let's get up on stage and perform and often uh, miss the body language of many of my students who are absolutely terrified at the prospect of that. But again, if you provide them with enough opportunities to perform, I, I'm a big believer in, you know, the more you expose them to it, the, the anxiety they feel behind it, uh, you know, wears off, especially as kids, because kids are just, yeah, I want to be part of it. I want to be part of this. And for some reason, like ask the kids about the concert and they can't wait for it. Ask the adults about it. They're all absolutely terrified. But the number one thing I, I hear is, <laughs> Oh, oh my God, like, do I have to perform? Da, da, da. And then as soon as they perform, they go, Oh man, when's the next one? That was amazing. So a lot of people have all these anxieties and fears of being judged or caught out. And, you know, I just say it's like dipping your toe in the water on a hot day. You know, you can dip your toe in the pool and go, that's a bit chilly. Maybe not now, but if you dive in, you start having fun straight away. There's that, you know, 30 seconds of discomfort for some people where you get the shocker hitting the water, but, uh, people can be overcome. But to what you said before, you know, can you help your students record things or put music out to the world or exactly. uh, how exactly. do they compose? Whatever it is. All these things outside of the basic lesson. But Tim, I'm aware of time. We're getting near the end of our time. So before I move on to the next sort of uh, round of questions, just tell us uh, where we can find your book and how our listeners can access it. As I said, this, this is directed most generally at piano teachers, but there is a lot of content in there which can inspire teachers of any instrument. And we have had... Uh, other instrumentalists and voice teachers use elements of this in other ways for their students. So, yeah, go and check it out. Uh, I think and I hope the arguments that I make in there resonates with you and makes you rethink potentially how you can run those first lessons on whatever instrument it is. So head to topmusic.co slash book. That has all the details. Uh, It's going to be in print and also as a digital download. Fantastic. So we'll make sure we include that link in the show notes wherever you're listening so you can access that one. And guys, buy the book. I'm not just uh, trying to tell you that so Tim makes more money and then pays me more money or he's sponsoring this in any way, shape or form. (laughs) But great ideas are great and they transcend instruments and there's going to be something in there. Tim, it's probably between $15 and $30. Is that correct? Between $9 and $25 actually. So it's even better. (laughs) And I would say, look, maybe one of your listeners will pick it up and read it and go, Tim... I've got the guitar version of this ready. How do I get this out there? And we could share some guitar ideas based on the same concept. I'd love to do that. Exactly. And uh, in terms of like for 10 bucks, which is what is the price of three coffees here in Melbourne, (laughs) we're getting close to the the, the price of a single coffee. One coffee almost now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. The price of a coffee with no marshmallow on top. Uh, You know, you're going to pick up something which you use to potentially change the trajectory of Even just one student that you teach, it's worth it. But the fact that you can take some of these ideas and literally go from, why are all my students quitting? I can't keep people, uh, they are the problem to, oh, hang on, there's all these new ideas I can inject to make my music teaching more vibrant, more fun, more interactive and engaging. And then 
you could turn your attention around or you could unlock this whole area of creativity that you've never, ever thought of. And I'm sure there's a bunch of, um, you know, ideas that are going to come out of that that you can use to a hugely, you know, beneficial influence on your teaching. Exactly. Yeah. Go and check it out. And uh, <laughs> I'm really keen to hear people's responses to it. Fantastic. All right. So we've got our last question, Tim. It's one of my favorite ones to ask. If you could impart one final bit of wisdom on our listeners in regards to teaching or it could be online business or writing your own book, what would that bit of advice be? <laughs> oh, my God. gosh. Uh, <laughs> how do I answer that? There are so many. There's so many elements to that. The, the trick question is we get you back for another podcast to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one piece of advice. I would say... The thing that has allowed me to develop the things that I've done and to achieve the things that I've achieved has been having the right people around me. And so I would say, and being flexible, I think they're my two sort of takeaways. So being really flexible in your approach to whatever, whatever it is you're doing and being open to new ideas and having a supportive network of people around you to support you and answer questions. That's the way I've done it, always done it. I've always learned. I've always been a learner. Love listening to podcasts, reading books, trying things out. But, you know, just having that community around you of people that can support you. That's why we've got Top Music Pro, Top Music Pro Guitar. Come and join us. Have that supportive group around you because it really, you can't do all these. I mean, you can do these things on your own, but it's much harder and it's not as fun. So, so having people around you that support you, I think is critical. Some fantastic advice to end there on. Tim, thanks so much for coming on. And to our listeners, thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you in the next episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. Thanks very much, guys. Hey there, guys. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. If you have any questions about anything we discussed on the podcast, reach out to me at michael at topmusic.co via email. If you want a guest on the show because you're doing some wonderful things in the teaching space, I would love to hear from you. Or if you've got any suggestions for guests or topics we can discuss, as always, you know where to find me. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is our Top Music Guitar Teaching membership. We have over a thousand members of Top Music, and that is a huge community of people that you can connect with online, share wonderful teaching tips, and of course, network with. We've also got over 20 courses for music teachers, 12 special ones for guitar on every topic imaginable from group teaching, private teaching, how to find more students, how to build websites, everything you could possibly want to need to know about teaching, building a business and getting more students is covered. And you get access to all of this for $49, probably less than what you charge for a one hour private lesson every single month. So don't miss out on this awesome opportunity. Visit our website, www.topmusicguitar.com and join us in the membership. Thank you so much and we'll see you next week.